state that the problem is not international law per se. International law is, is a good thing. It is a, a necessary and proper thing. International law governs the relationships between the states, and it has its proper uses. It's the misuse of international law that is the issue, this transnationalist jurisprudence and the use of what is called soft law, or in Espanol, ley blanda, that is the, uh, is the problem. For example, in the Constitution of the United States, international law in some form is mentioned three times. So international law does have its proper uses. Uh, but what happens, and I think what, if you're familiar with Austin and his organization's group, which focuses on the United Nations and other international organizations, is that activists and members of treaty monitoring bodies uh, try to create new norms. The sources of international law, legitimate international law, are principally treaties and something that is known as customary international law. But what these activists try to do is to take treaties that, for example, might uh, which in nowhere mention abortion and read into them uh, a, uh, a, a, a right to abortion. You know, so, for example, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights nowhere mentions abortion. In fact, where it talks about the death penalty, it says that a, uh, a pregnant woman may not be put to death. Okay? Another woman who's above age 18 could be put to death, but not a pregnant woman. Whose life interest is being protected there? The unborn child. Yet people that are on these treaty monitoring bodies have read into it a right to abortion, which is contrary to the actual words of the, uh, of the treaties. An example of this, and for Latin America, it is the template case, uh, was the Colombian Constitutional Tribunal, which in 2006 overturned a, a part of the law that prohibited abortion, that had protected the right to life in Colombia. Part of the reasoning was, it said, because we have these international norms that require abortion liberalization. They did not look, they could not look to the language of treaties, but instead looked at these proclamations from these treaty monitoring bodies that interpreted the treaties and said that you, that you had to liberalize the laws on abortion. This is a this is a problem, we see that in the United States too, where the judiciary is very activist. The judiciary essentially takes the law, the, the role of the legislature and starts to make laws, judge-made laws. Okay, if Roe v. Wade was bad, the Colombian decision, called C-155, was even worse because the source of, of the authority that they looked for to, to change the law was not even within the Colombian Constitution, but these supranational, these transnational norms. Okay? We saw the same thing happen very recently, just uh, three months ago in Argentina, where the Argentine Supreme Court liberalized the law on abortion with regard to rape. Okay? There was no justification for this because the legislature uh, had put certain conditions, but the judges, again, appealing to these international uh, treaty monitoring bodies created a, uh, a right to abortion in the instances of rape. So what then can be done? What as international lawyers can we do? Well, one thing that's very important is that we are clear about what the, the sources of international law are. Now, unfortunately, we have a very short time here, so we cannot explain it in, in full. Uh, we can point you to some uh, materials that we have written, both in English and in Spanish, articles on this that discuss this issue. But again, the principal sources of international law are treaty law and then what is known as customary international law. Customary international law is not as precise as treaty law, but it is not so open that you can include uh, something such as a right to abortion. Let's talk about specific examples, principally from Latin America, where countries have stood up to the pressure, the, uh, the demand that they have must liberalize their law. And, and Carmen later, Carmen Dominguez, will talk about some of the pressure that countries are under. One example is Nicaragua. In Nicaragua in, in 2006, the country actually 
tightened its law, made the law more protective of unborn life with respect to abortion. When they did this, they received a tremendous amount of pressure from United Nations organizations, such as the United Nations Population Fund, UNICEF, the Children's Fund, uh, and UNDP. They also received pressure from countries, in particular the Scandinavian countries, United Kingdom, <coughs> Canada, Holland, saying that they were violating international law by protecting unborn life. It's a false claim, it's an untrue claim. Sweden cut off $20 million worth of aid to Nicaragua in an attempt to pressure us. This was just after Nicaragua had suffered the terrible hurricane, a poor country. So this is aid money is used to pressure countries. Nicaragua, very interestingly, under the Sandinista government, a left-wing government, yet one that is protective of life, uh, stood up to these countries. And it's very interesting, Daniel Ortega, the president of Nicaragua, actually has a very interesting criticism of the abortion policies of the countries of the global north. You know, it's an attempt to oppress the uh, poor people of the, the developing world. Okay, so that is one example where the pressure was resisted. Another example, the Dominican Republic, uh, two, uh, three years later, uh, 2009, amended its constitution to protect the right to life from conception and also to protect marriage which is being between one man and one woman. Again, a tremendous amount of pressure. Uh, this time the lead person attacking Nicaragua from the international organizations was from UNICEF. If you think UNICEF is about helping children, that's not what it's, uh, what it's about. It's, it's one of the organizations at the UN that does promote abortion where they have uh, an opportunity. They pick children, unborn children, against their mothers. Um, so a tremendous amount of pressure also from uh, international uh, groups such as Amnesty International, pressuring the Dominican Republic. But again, the Dominican Republic stood up to them, amended its constitution to protect life and family. Uh, a role about for example, how we were involved, actually at that time I was with, with uh, CFAM, we wrote a letter, an opinion letter, to the Congress of the Dominican Republic and the President of the Dominican Republic, saying what are obligations under international law. That international law, properly understood, supports the right to life. There is no right to abortion in international law. Another example is the case uh, of Peru. Peru has come under criticism from, uh, in recent years, two treaty monitoring bodies. One treaty monitoring body is the one, I, I talked about the treaty that uh, the International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights, which talks about uh, the unborn child, that a pregnant woman cannot be put to death because the unborn child has an independent right to life. Yet that committee read in a right to abortion and pressured Peru to liberalize its laws regarding eugenic abortion. Peru prohibits eugenic abortion. Peru, to its credit, again, resisted the pressure. Okay, another example, when the CEDAW Committee, the, commission, the, the uh, Convention on the Elimination of All Forms against, of Discrimination Against Women, again, a treaty that does not mention abortion. When the CEDAW Committee criticized Peru and said it must liberalize its laws, on the basis of this, a congressmen, a group of congressmen in Peru, tried to initiate legislation to liberalize the laws. They said, well, we must change our laws to conform to this. We were asked to do an opinion letter on what does international law state by a pro-life congressman. We gave him this opinion letter, and he was able to use this to block this other initiative. So that's another uh, example. Um, Finally, I want to talk about a very important case that is in front of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. Of all the treaties in the world, the one that is most explicit in protecting unborn life is the American Convention on Human Rights, or the Pacto de San Jose. It's called the, the Pact of San Jose. It protects life in general from conception, desde concepción is the phrase that is used. And for many years, the inter-American system was very, was for the most part, protective of life. 
But what we've seen is the corruption of the inter-American system now, where you have commissioners, especially on the Inter-American Commission, who want to push abortion, uh, even though the actual words of the treaty are very explicit in that regard. Okay. In the case of Costa Rica, Costa Rica prohibited in vitro fertilization, fecundación in vitro, because of the principle that when you have uh, in vitro fertilization techniques, embryos are destroyed. Okay? The uh, Inter-American Commission disregarded the opinion of, uh, of Costa Rica. Costa Rica had a defense based on the specific article that protects life from conception. They, they ignored it completely and said that uh, you have to uh, allow in vitro fertilization. Right now, this case is before the Inter-American Court. Uh, the Alliance Defense Fund, along with other organizations, allied organizations, we submitted uh, an amicus curiae brief uh, defending Costa Rica's law protecting unborn life. I think I will wrap up and allow my other colleagues, but hopefully we can uh, have a chance to discuss this during the question and answer period. Thank you. And, and